Hi, Harish. Thank you so much for joining us for this interview. Pleasure. Uh, to start off with, we just wanted you to elaborate a little bit about your law, rule of law project that began in about September 2014. Yeah, so the, um, the main purpose behind, when we started, the main purpose behind the rule of law project was to understand in more detail the issue of delays before the judiciary because everybody talks about this massive backlog of about three crore cases right. that is pending yeah. before the judiciary, but nobody knows anything beyond that three crore number, including you know people in the judiciary and the government. And um, so we thought, okay, let's collect data to understand the three crore number. So, um, you know, what does the three crore mean? Are there some courts which has which have more number, more uh, cases pending? Are there courts which have lesser number of cases pending? Uh, is it a personnel problem? Is it an inefficiency problem? We just wanted to understand more. Mm. So the initial um, purpose was to um, get data. But once we started getting data, we realized that we can't just stop data and we sort of expanded the scope of the project. Um, and that is reflected in the name. Um, the idea is, okay, if the judiciary does not uh, decide cases that have come, that are brought before it you know, uh, properly and in time, then it has an impact on the um, ability of the law to regulate society as a well. whole. So that's why it's called the rule of law project. Right. Although I mean, somebody did point out to us, isn't it? We just call it the judicial delays project. Right. But we deliberately called it the rule of law project because uh, to drive home the point that um, it is not just a question of delay, because the question, the issue of uh, not deciding cases on time, has a larger impact, which we need to focus on. So you know, it, it, as as I mentioned, it started in um, uh, in, in late two thousand fourteen, and we are um, we are in, uh, just about two years now, and we have progressed a lot on the on the data collection part, and uh, we have been successful in in doing some amount of analysis of the data, and you know, we have brought out the state of the judiciary report uh, earlier this year. Um, so there's more to do. Thank you. So, so from this data-driven, data-backed project that you're doing, has there been any imminent or more obvious solutions that you feel can be implemented in the short term? Um, yes, um, we believe there are some easily implementable solutions in the short term that does not require um, many rule changes and um, doesn't cost that much. I think those are the two key Right. Um, uh, factors when you're looking at short term, uh, you know, changes that you can implement. Um, the one thing that we have we are we have uh, proposed and are trying to propagate is to um, make better use of judicial time in the subordinate judiciary, uh, in the trial courts and uh, magistrates courts and municipal courts, right. by implementing what many high courts have already framed. Uh, called the case flow management rules. Right. So this essentially is a um, is a binding rule on the subordinate judiciary about um, you know the uh, number of hearings that a case can go through, the time period uh, within right. which a case has to be decided, um, and and so on and so forth. Essentially, it talks about the lifetime of a case before the subordinate judiciary. Right. So many high, about fifteen high courts have already drafted rules, but they have not been implemented. Right. And uh, we believe. Um, those rules, if implemented, together with um, a technology intervention. Um, when I mean technology intervention, it means you know you um, you make um, date giving more predictive. Uh, currently, what happens is that if you go to a court today and you have a case mm -hmm. and um, you some either party uh, is not available in court that day or the judge is busy and the judge looks at both of you and says, okay, what date do you want? Mm -hmm. um, there's complete um, uncertainty when you go to court that day as to whether your matter will be heard, whether it will be postponed, and how long will it be postponed for? Right. Uh, there's uncertainty about that. And there is uncertainty about whether the judge will be free on the day, on the new date, mm -hmm. or one of the parties will be available on the new date. So we are coming up with a, a plan which removes some of the uncertainty and that's what I mean by predictive uh, date fixing. Right. Um, so we have come up with a, with a plan and um, 
because the courts are also now using uh, technology quite a bit, you know, the entire e-courts project, we believe um, that it can be implemented without too much cost um, and without too much effort um, in terms of human effort. Um, it just requires the right, inten uh, the right purpose and the right intention um, from the decision makers. Um, so we are trying to get to implement this as a pilot in a couple of districts um, around the country. Mm, we have written to a couple of chief justices and law ministers and if they respond positively then hopefully uh, we should try and implement it in the next yeah. in the next six months or whatever. And based on that, um, you know, it's possible to see whether it, it works or not. Right. Because currently, we believe that about 45 to 50 percent of judicial time right. in the lower courts on a given day mm -hmm. is used for things that are not uh, judicial in nature. So for ad purely administrative acts like issuing notices, you know. Um, asking, okay, what date should I postpone the matter to, or things like that, which doesn't require a judge uh, to make the decision. It's, it's a pure administrative act. So how do we maximize the judicial time? And if you combine that with the predictive uh, date giving, we believe that there could be um, an immediate efficiency improvement of uh, up to 40, 45%. Wow. And uh, so that is something hopefully we can implement, yeah. but we don't know. No, that's a great point you bring up, like differentiating and probably separating the administrative <coughs> and adjudicating yes. side because the judge does not necessarily need to be present for all these administrative decisions and yes. might not even have the expertise in efficiency that's and his expertise does lie on the adjudicating side. Yes. So this definitely you see as one of the more immediate solutions and more viable solution. Well, separating administrative and judicial side I don't think is an immediate solution because there is a lot of structural issues, there will be a lot of opposition right. from the judiciary in terms of separation. Right. Um, I think so what the immediate solution that we are proposing is um, giving some of the tasks the judge is currently doing to the registry, right. which is already an existing uh, oh, functionary right. body within the uh, judiciary and the rules already provide for it. Right. So it's the case from management rules, the case from management rules actually clearly specify that uh, you know, uh, some A to F tasks, some six tasks can be given to the registry, but nobody has you know bothered to implement that. Now the point about separation is a larger point, right? Um, and that I think so. There are two. There are, again, there are two two different aspects. There. One is the day-to-day -day functioning, uh, judicial tasks and administrative tasks, and uh, and then the larger. Uh, administrative task of being able to look at the functioning of the judiciary as a whole and you know monitoring what is happening right, right? and that's what any 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 body does right. so separation at that level separation at both levels should happen now whether they should function as a separate body i think that is where um, judiciary will have an issue i think by and large, um, the younger judges, the younger high court judges we, we have spoken to at, at many events, all are in favor of um, separating um, administrative tasks and judicial tasks. Because right. it, it is not just a question of intent, it's also a question of time. Now look at um, a judge, for example, a high court judge or a, or a uh, subordinate court judge. He, he has, um, you know, uh, from 10.30 to uh, 5 o'clock, if he's a high court judge and if he's a subordinate court judge from about 11 to about 5.30, they are doing judicial tasks, they are in court. Um, and then the hope is that most of them are preparing uh, in the mornings or the evenings uh, for the next day's uh, cases or they are writing judgments. Right. So where do they have the time for administrative tasks? Yeah. It is not just one, it is not just a question of ability, it is also a question of time. And if somebody focuses more, gives more time to the administrative task, then they're ignoring, not, I wouldn't say ignoring is a, is a strong word, but I think they they do not have enough time then for the judicial uh, task. More uh, if focus, prioritizing. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And this is a serious problem. Right. Uh, there are many high courts uh, across the country where 
the administrative tasks are divided among the senior judges. Although the chief justice of each high court is the administrative head, he requests you know senior judges to uh, senior colleagues to help him out. So there are many committees. I know, for example, in some high courts, there are about 13, 14 committees looking at various administrative tasks. Sometimes they don't even meet for a year, yeah. right? And then, so who is actually looking at it? So there, are, there is a serious issue of time and capacity. Apart from expertise, expertise is the you know is the third question. Even in, in terms of basic time, you don't have time. Yeah. So you are asking somebody who doesn't have time to look after you know administrative issues. You can't. So there needs to be a separation. Mm -hmm. Now whether now how far should that separation go? I think there's the there's the issue of judicial independence. So I do not think the judiciary will agree to a to a body that manages the judicial system and is independent of the judicial system. So, so there might be some. It has to be. A some system, down, yes. yeah, it has to be some system that reports to the judiciary finally, right. which is okay. I don't have a problem with that because if you look at um, international uh, experiences, right. most countries have um, the administrative, the bodies looking after that judicial administration reporting to the, you know, to the chief justice of the court, which by itself is okay. I mean, it's you know, it's sort of a you know, uh, a reporting line that ensures judicial independence, but also brings in the necessary expertise and time that is required to manage a complex system. Um, because our judicial system has become so complex, judges can't manage it anymore True. and we need to fix this. True. Uh, so stepping a little away from the management and the administrative side, uh, your report also talks about access to justice. Could you highlight some of the points that have come about, like do you identify certain groups that are particularly vulnerable or what are the certain uh, problems that you see to access to justice? Okay, so there are various facets um, in access to justice. So access to justice, the conversation in India has been, unfortunately, it has become a, a resource problem. Right. They're thinking people are not getting access because there are not enough judges and not enough courts mm -hmm. and not enough lawyers, okay? Or, or not enough good lawyers who can give good advice. So, But it is not just a resource problem, okay? It has, so there, there are different facets. Right? There are people who cannot approach the courts because either because of um, either because they're not aware of their legal rights or because their rights are not recognized in a manner that is implementable. Okay, let's take you know just a, a simple example is the you know is the uh, Vishaka case, right? The sexual right. harassment at the workplace. Until it was declared, people didn't think. That okay, this is right. a this is a right, you know, and you you have a right not to be harassed at the workplace. You know, you come to so you access know, of justice also supplements is also by absolutely lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. So legal literacy is obviously an important uh, facet, and that that is uh, that is constantly improving. So I don't think um, while we need to put more efforts into improving that, um, and that is a that is a real long term goal because in even in the most advanced of countries. There is an issue of legal literacy and you know awareness of rights. That's Definitely. a that's a uh, problem forever. So we need to focus on that. But then access to then you when you're trying to access the institutions that um, are able to implement those rights, that's where you know there's a resource problem as well. Um, resource problem, not uh, first in terms of the lawyers or people who can advise on on, on uh, rights in a cost-effective and uh, competent manner. And that is a challenge. The two, unfortunately, don't go with each other. Um, and uh, legal aid, while they are trying to do something, the, con the entire conversation and structure around legal aid in this country has become, uh, has become quite uh, difficult. And, and it, it, is, it is a failure to a large extent because, again, I, I come back to the fact um, about judiciary getting involved in things that it shouldn't be. Right. Like if you look at the legal aid structure, I mean the judiciary is the body that is being given the task of implementing it. Right. The, the legal aid yes, the legal service authority is all manned by judges. I mean right. it, it, it just doesn't make sense. You need people, you know, who can understand how to you know how to implement some of these things. Then um, but coming back to like who are the groups uh, to your question of the groups that are being marginalized. Right. We did a survey last year um, trying to examine, um, for example, uh, who, are, who are the people who are accused of crimes and have cases, criminal cases pending against them. Now the majority, I think more than 50% of the 
uh, people we interviewed in our sample have income levels, annual income levels of less than one lakh. Right. They come from uh, marginalized sections, right. that is um, other backward classes or um, SESTs, and they're all first time accused. Right? So this is a staggering, if you read all three of them together, right. it's, it, it's staggering. And they're all in their 20s. Okay. Right? And these are the people who are not getting good, competent legal aid. Right. And many of them don't get bail because they don't have the money to post bail. So this is an access to justice problem because while they have access to the institutions, right. they don't have access to justice. justice. And this is directly linked to the efficiency of the courts. So while you have one um, problem of improving access to the judicial system by um, improving literacy and uh, improving and ensuring that rights are um, more properly and widely affirmed on a regular basis, and this is both in the hands of the judiciary and the legislature, um, and then the second is an institutional problem. Right. But we are not, but somehow we focus on um, only a resource problem from the institutional perspective and not the citizen's perspective. Yeah. So unless we start, unless we flip this access to justice issue on its head and say we have to look at it from the citizen's perspective, we'll only think about increasing budget for you know the legal services authority and you know have more and more local dollars which is not the solution for access to justice all right i think that's all the time we have so thank you so okay. much yeah thank you thank pleasure you. talking to you, thank you.